for you. I don't speak Ukrainian, so this is going to be translated into English. Who does not understand English at all? So everybody speaks a little bit. That is very good. Thank you very much, Natalia, for this invitation and for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me and a great honor to be in this lovely environment under the golden roof of this uh, cinema. And uh, the theme of these lectures, the relation between the center and the periphery of the city, lies at the bottom of my talk. I'm talking precisely about this part of urban development. My lecture is called The New Tenement and uh, it is connected with a project that I have been conducting for the last five years and which will result in the publication of this book that you see on the left in October of this year, which is an architectural history of the quote-unquote return to the inner city. Um, a tenement, it was translated into Ukrainian, my talk, well, the title of my talk was translated into Ukrainian as a new form of living, but the word tenement in English, I think more or less would be the equivalent of what in Ukrainian is Kamenica, or what in Polish is Kamienica, what in German is Mietzkaserne, what in Basically, the buildings of the late 19th century with five stories and built on the perimeter block with courtyards in the inner parts of the block. Dense abodes of, on the one hand, the working classes and on the other hand, of the middle classes. Buildings that appeared from the mid-19th century onwards uh, in, the, in what was then the peripheries of all Central European cities. And also beyond Central Europe, in Scotland, for example, in Glasgow, they are quite um, common. But tenement in English also has a negative connotation, basically the connotation of slum, the connotation of an overcrowded building where the exploited working classes live under terrible conditions, and a condition that was supposed to be removed in the 1950s, building exactly these kind of developments that you find here in Suhif. So the new tenement, the idea that there is a, a return to these old forms, has something to do with the rediscovery of this old building type, but at the same time with a reinvention of this building type. My talk is about a rather simple fact, but that for a long time was by no means taken for granted. Uh, European cities, and particularly inner cities, in recent decades have been discovered as a place of, rediscovered as a place of residence. This is probably not that much noticeable in a city such, such as Lviv or in any of the Eastern European cities where you did not have such strong decentralization policies. But in cities of Western Europe, including London, including Paris, including West German cities, throughout the 1950s and 1960s there was an active policy of decentralization, of suburbanization, of dissolving the cities, connected with the development that the privileged classes were moving out of the city center into the urban periphery. This development has been reversed from the 1970s onwards. And this reversal, this renaissance of the city center, this return of the privileged classes to the inner city had a social quality and has also an architectural quality. 
and the connection between both was the topic of my project. This book is mainly about uh, Glasgow, Berlin, Vienna, Rotterdam, and Paris, and uh, and um, and Copenhagen, but indirectly about almost any European city. You see here the um, population growth rates of select cities, and what you can see, for example, in London, very clear, this is the 1950s, and from 1950s onwards, the city has been shrinking up to 1991, and from then it has been growing again. You see the same in Paris, this approximately is the 1950s, shrinkage up to the 1990s and growth again. In Vienna it's even clearer because obviously at the beginning of the First World War Vienna was like the largest metropolis in Central Eastern Europe. Since then there was a decrease up to the 1990s and from the 1990s again growth. And even in Berlin, where, the, the, where, there, where there was a less steady development, obviously related to the two world wars, there was, since the 1950s, shrinkage, and then from the 1990s, growth again. So, we are talking about a demographic development, which is even more surprising as the countries, these respective countries as a whole, have not been growing so much. Most countries of Europe are actually decreasing population. So, um, okay. so what am I going to talk about? I'm first talking about plans, types, buildings, what was actually built. What is then important is the location of these buildings within the particular cities. Who started the development? Who were the actors? And what was the background? And eventually, what do these buildings or this renaissance of the city center mean for life in these buildings? So, what was built? already mentioned the tenement which in Glasgow would connote approximately these buildings. This looks rather similar to what, is, what, what, what was built in the center of Lviv in the 19th century, um, Vienna even more, Berlin. I mean this is a European building type of four to five story buildings with courtyards that were built for mixed use, that means you have commercial premises here, sometimes, and in the backyard you have small industry, small business, historically also horse stables or cow stables or blacksmiths workshops or whatnot. So a particular urban type that was connected to the industrial growth in the 19th century. So, the new tenement, as I define it in my book, looks similar but different. There are, on the one hand, tenements proper, that means typologies that take from the 19th century buildings. As you see, this building in Glasgow is a clear reference to the old tenements. This one in Glasgow as well, or this one in Berlin, where we would see a reinvention of this old, of this old type. Other buildings are modeled, are still dense buildings, are still inner city buildings, but they are not, as for example these buildings, um, structures where you have a central stairway and then flats on the left and on the right, but just one entrance and one owner per building. So it is more a row house, a townhouse typology. And eventually you even have buildings that are modeled after modernist blocks, Zeilenbau 
schemes where we have one block behind the other. So my point is not that the return of the inner city was related to exclusively a return of this building type. There were similar types, but they had in common that they were designed for density and they were designed for mixed use in the city center. What did these buildings look like? Also stylistically there is a great variety of these new tenements. And I am just mentioning a few stylistic themes. The neo-rationalist theme influenced by the Italian neo-rationalists of the 1960s and 1970s, most famously Aldo Rossi, you probably know the name. Uh, were related to an approach that architecture should take on and should work with historic typologies but not imitate historic forms. So this is not supposed to be neo-historical but this is supposed to be uh, working with long-standing building typologies which could be these roof forms, these gables, which could be these beams, which could be even a form such an amphitheater as you find it here, but generally is supposed to not look historical. That was the neo-rationalist theme. A very common theme in, Eastern, in, in, in European cities is also the neoclassical theme. So these are all buildings from the 1970s and 1980s. Um, some, this one here in Berlin, a clear reference to a bourgeois 19th century building. This one here in, in uh, Berlin as well, or this one in Vienna, here in Copenhagen, here in Glasgow, this one again in Berlin. So the class neoclassical form, strip neoclassical, also neoclassical without ornaments. And there is also an ongoing influence of, of modern functionalist architecture, but not anymore in the types of blocks and towers as before, but in dense perimeter block structures, as you find here. Where did these buildings appear? New tenements were connected to urban renewal and by urban renewal I mean the policies of the 1950s and 1960s to tear down an entire neighborhood and rebuild it from scratch, usually with tower blocks. There are different words for this. In Britain it was called comprehensive redevelopment, in Germany it was called Stadterneuerungen, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands it was, was called Staatsvernjowing. So um, this approach, which was very wasteful and came with the incredible optimism of the 1960s that the urban environment could be reinvented completely from scratch, this approach met with increasing protests throughout the 1960s and 1970s and grinded to a halt in the 1970s in most European countries. So um, the new tenements were often built on these urban renewal sites, sites where the old buildings from the 19th century had been cleared and the new tower blocks were not yet built there. So there was the change in the paradigm and you would build these new buildings which had some references to the old buildings as the one here in Berlin, this one in Copenhagen or even this one here in Rotterdam. So post-urban renewal sites was one of the important areas in which these new tenements showed up. And um, the other big theme of late 20th and early 21st century urbanism was the deindustrialization and the adaptive reuse 
of post-industrial sites. And there is where, on the one hand, the factories in the inner city, factories, breweries, whatever, and on the other hand, port sites. So you find that all over Western Europe, starting out with the uh, uh, with, uh, Docklands and London that were started in the early 1980s, up to the present. And these include very prestigious sites where like rich people live, usually these waterfront sites, but also places sort of in slightly the periphery of the inner city, still very central, like this one, or this former freight train station in Vienna. So the reuse of these areas is the big challenge for urban development and new tenements were often built there. Who built these buildings? There is a big discussion about how these developments were related to the changes in politics and economy in the 1970s, mainly deindustrialization and the inception of neoliberal policies. And one of these cliché ideas, one of the ideas that one hears very often is that new tenements are basically the architecture of neoliberalism, the architecture of a time when the state retreats from its responsibility of, uh, 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 for housing their citizens, and the private uh, but market steps in. And my Research has shown that this is not true. The new tenements were actually mostly built by welfare state institutions. That means by interventionist institutions, by institutions who were still funneling state funds into the provision of housing, as was done, for example, in the Soviet Union. Or if the welfare state or the socialist state steps completely back, what you get is not new tenements, but what you get would be gated communities, ghettos of the rich, developers who only think about their particular parcels and do not care about mixed use or the, um, the, the, the program of the environment. So, these welfare state institutions that built the new tenements were quite different ones. There were municipalities, as here in Vienna, which is the same municipality which basically built the famous Red Vienna buildings in the 1920s and who was a major <coughs> actor on the housing market throughout the 20th century. You had new actors, such as these community-based housing associations in Glasgow, which were nonetheless funded and regulated by the national state. So, if you see this, this was at the height of Margaret Thatcher's neoliberal policies, and yet this was mostly funded through state's money, through tax money. And also these non-profit housing associations in Berlin in the 1980s, or in Copenhagen up to date, are still the welfare state institutions that had, in earlier periods, funded the modernist estates, the Rajone, the peripheral tower block settlements. So it's not that the return to the inner city had something to do with creating completely no institutions, it was a change within the institution. And that is the important thing. They resulted from a welfare state that was under pressure by neoliberalism, but was not yet completely retreated, or that has not completely retreated. There are also new tenements built by private developers, but even 
a development such as this one, and the year is actually, this is 2009, so this is a approximately eight-year-old development. And this is a very high-end upmarket development for very rich people in the Prenzlauer Berg neighborhood in the inner city. But nonetheless, such a development connected with gentrification and with the influx of rich people into a former working class neighborhood, also something like that could only be built through the regulating, regulatory influence of the welfare state institutions, which, for example, regulated how many stories could be built here, how dense this could be built, and um, the specificities of the construction. And the same applies to these Glasgow examples. So, private developers stepped in, but nonetheless, the state has not retreated yet. Why was this built? That's the important question. Well, throughout the 1960s and 1970s, there were different threads of anti-modernist criticism. People who criticized the modernist tower block estates, the Rayone, and they criticized them on different grounds. For example, Jane Jacobs, in what was possibly the most influential single book in the history of urban planning, spoke in favor of the inhabited wall, the wall by meaning the buildings that border a traditional corridor street as a precondition for a socially mixed and lively city. She says, in tower blocks, this would not happen. Kevin Lynch spoke in favor of a strong, recognizable image, a legible structure. He said that a 19th century city, such as the center of Lviv, uh, is much more legible than something like Suhiv, where you cannot find your way through these tower blocks. That was his point. Or people such as Oscar Newman talking about the security advantage that a 19th century corridor street, as this one here in New York, has in comparison to a tower block screen. screen because they say that because people are watching out of your window, when you walk there late at night, you are less likely to get mugged or less likely to get raped or less likely to get beaten up if compared to a tower block development where people would just be able to hide between bushes. So, different threads of anti-modernist criticism, and some of them, in some of them, the image of the old tenement loomed very large. You had people such as in Germany, the um, uh, publisher Wolf Jobs Ziegler, who in the 19, 1960s uh, indicted urban renewal for destroying a beautiful old environment. So this was basically um, a criticism on aesthetics, but at the same time, social grounds. Or Jan Geel, who in the 1970s, in his bestseller, Life Between Buildings, uh, pointed out to the social qualities uh, uh, of the historic 19th century cities. And eventually, Many of these ideas have become mainstream, particularly in the United States, where the new urbanism movement actually uh, advocated for the pedestrian-oriented city that takes from the historic 19th century city. So, the idea of the tenement loomed very large in some of these um, uh, 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 works. And this one, for example, the old tenement was very important and the new urbanists slightly less. In Europe, and particularly in Germany, this idea or this modernist criticism 
was connected with a discourse on the urban citizen, on the Stadtbürger. And particularly in Berlin, but also in other places and also in other European countries, the urban citizen was this ideal type of a person who should inhabit these, who should inhabit a, a city that had positive qualities. So urban cities and Stadtbürger also implying member of the urban bourgeoisie and implies a middle class person who develops his or her individualism within a framework of clearly defined rules and shows a declared commitment with the polity. So there is an ideal vision of the pre-modern city inhabited by individual bourgeois middle class people who are individuals but are a commit, show a commitment with the community. So they are not rich people who just steal from the others. They're also not uh, uh, people who just think about their own uh, understanding. So obviously that's an ideal vision of the pre-modern city that probably has little to do with how the pre-modernist city was organized in reality, but it's an image that became very important in the 1980s, 1990s, and to a certain extent uh, is still today. Uh, it was brought forward, for example, by the, uh, uh, by the psychologist Alexander Mitscherlich, the West German psychologist, um, in his anti-modernist criticism against the inhospital modern cities, by which he means the tower block cities, something like a Suhif, but also in the planning and social policy developments of the 1990s, as you can see here in the middle, where the European city, the idea of the European city is waged against the uh, allegedly placeless and inhospital uh, modernist city. And, and it inspired a lot of urban plans of the 1990s, and I only mention the example of the master plan for the inner city in Berlin, which was the first master plan after the German reunification, and which attempted to reinstate the pre-war plan. Wherever the pre-war cities, uh, streets were, did not exist anymore, they were to be rebuilt. And this was done with this undercurrent of, that we have of the idea that we have to rebuild the city so that it attracts urban citizens, so that it attracts these middle class people. And yeah. uh, the idea also influenced the, addition, the international discourse. It was constitutive, for example, in the Urban Age program, which since, 19, since 2005 was organized by the London School of Economics, and um, which is generously sponsored by the Deutsche Bank. So, unsurprisingly, this program follows an anti-interventionist agenda, because it is not anymore the state who should fund the construction of housing. It is the urban citizen, the bourgeois middle class person. So, the, the, the state is not supposed to intervene here, because if we organize the city in the right way, then it's the urban citizens who, within the framework, the legal framework, organized their own city. An underlying idea is that, that the clash between different people and different ideas in the modernist city is the precondition for creativity and innovation. And this city, is this idea, was brought forward most famously by Georg Simmel in his uh, uh, essay 
the metropolis and mental life from the beginning of the 20th century. And it has been reiterated over and over, this idea of a creative abrasion. So you need this legislative framework, certain things are allowed, certain things are not allowed in the city, but within this framework you need difference, you need uh, people of different religions, of different sexual orientations, of different ages, of different uh, um, uh, 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 different income groups, of different profession, and the clash creates creativity. This idea, as Simmel presents it, is a rather neutral one that does not necessarily come with a political goal, but as it is used, for example, in the work of Richard Florida, the rise of the creative class, it actually comes with a political goal, because the creativity, as Richard Florida defines it, does not refer to artists, inventors, designers. For Florida, the creative class is business people, entrepreneurs. He says a banker, for him, is a creative person because it's an entrepreneur. So you can see how this sort of uh, interpretation of the pre-modern city can be formulated in a way that particularly appeals to business-orientated politicians, mayors who say, we have to attract the creative class. We need bankers who live in our city center and therefore we get innovation. So it's a thin... Uh, and yeah. So how is life in these buildings? How does the who, how do the people in the new tenement city eventually live? And I would just like to point out that the phenomenon that I am describing is one that has quite different expressions. Different expressions meaning from areas that are designed for an upmarket clientele to some that are rather mixed. And uh, this example that I show here in the Friedrichswerder redevelopment in the center of Berlin is such an upmarket development. You have people who live here, but it is usually not families, it's usually young urban professionals, yuppies who live in, uh, who appreciate living in the city center, but it's in, in, at the same time um, rich business people. But you still see that they have private spaces here and public spaces there. They live densely. It's not a car-oriented environment. There are certain aspects that are decidedly different from the modern city. You have this development in Slüsseholm in the South Harbour in Copenhagen, which is the result of a welfare state that has not been dismantled. This is an urban development where the state still takes responsibility for housing their citizens. And as a matter of fact, it's a development that is not, that is for rather not poor and not rich people. It's a lot for families who um, appreciate living in dense environments. So, as you also see, it's not a car-oriented environment. It is not an it's environment where um, pedestrian life is very important, where leisure is very important. This is an old harbor development. So the idea of looking at the uh, water, of using the water for leisure activities, such as boating, rowing, swimming, is very important. This is, for example, a um, a bath, a public bath, where the people can enjoy the water. So, um, it's one of the uh, examples where you can see the tight con connection between living, working, 
and leisure environment. This example from Berlin, a built and an old brewery, is also compar and comparatively an upmarket development as far as this as far as this is concerned, this area. The wider neighborhood, Kreuzberg, is a former working class neighborhood. So, critics would say this is the beginning of a ghetto for the rich. Um, the promoters of this would say, compared to London or Los Angeles, this is an environment where still you find a very mixed neighborhood because there are is lots of social housing around here and slightly wealthier people around here. So if you are in favor or, in, or against this kind of developments, uh, this depends a lot on what you compare it with. A very important, very interesting development from Glasgow which is a twice cleared neighborhood. The Gorbals were subject of urban renewal, of comprehensive clearance of 19th century building of Kamienice in the 1950s. They were replaced by tower blocks and in 1992 the last tower blocks were torn down again. These are not standing anymore and these kind of tower blocks you would find everywhere. And what was rebuilt was a new tenement neighborhood that took from the aspect of the 19th century neighborhood. And here you can see how the 19th century uh, city was pretty much reinvented here. The courtyards are much bigger than in the 19th century neighborhood. They're exclusively used for leisure purposes. There is no uh, workshop and no um, light industry in the workshops anymore. There is car traffic and there is a lot of parking even here, but it is still a neighborhood that is supposed to be pedestrian oriented, where you're supposed to walk to the corner shops here. And even the typology of the 19th century tenement with its perimeter block buildings here um, is adapted to the cultural um, specificities of Glasgow where um, you have people, where you have a strong uh, tradition of living in terraced single family houses. So actually the lower portions of these buildings are mezzanets with a separate entrance and only the upper portions of the buildings are actually flats with a common entrance as in the 19th century building. The rebuilding of the Gorbals came with a reinvention or rather reinterpretation of history. And this is an undercurrent that you find almost everywhere in these new tenement neighborhoods. The 19th century, and particularly the late 19th century, the period of rapid industrialization, was reinterpreted. Before 1970s, it had a mainly bad connotation. The stress was laid particularly in socialist environments as Glasgow, which is a heavily left-leaning city, but in the same way in Eastern Europe. The stress in the interpretation of the 19th century was laying on the exploitation of the workers by evil capitalists and on the overcrowding and on the, the, the uh, terrible hygienic conditions in which these people were um, supposed to live. From 1970 onwards, when overcrowding and misery was largely removed, the late 19th century began to be interpreted in a more positive way. In Glasgow, it was now connected to industrial strength, to economic success. 
In Eastern Europe, it was connected to the strength of the workers and the strength of the workers' movement. So you had this kind of change in the reinterpretation even in East Germany on socialist countries, where all of a sudden it was no longer about evil capitalists, it was about strong workers. And this can be seen almost everywhere in, architect in architectural details, when all of a sudden you have nostalgic images of 19th century workers of these factories here, this is an ornament in one of these um, windows. Or here you see a welder as the symbol for industrial Glasgow. We are strong, we are building ships, we are proud of our shipbuilding industry. So historical references as a celebration of the 19th century, I mention that as a sign how History is important in the image marketing that comes with the new tenement city and with this return to the inner city. In a way, it is also a way of legitimization of the new middle classes who move in there. Because obviously nowadays in these new tenements there are no industrial workers living anymore. There are some workers but most of them are middle class people. So here you see the difference between also the crowded 19th century city. This is the same street in uh, 1900 and in approximately seven years ago. Where you see this is no longer a, true, uh, a through street, but it is still a public place which can be used for play, where people go shopping, but no overcrowding. On the other hand, the reinterpretation of the urban environment and of the uh, urban space contrasts with a continuity of the plans. The new tenements were actually um, rather similar when built for a social housing environment, like this one, which were socially rented flats, or for an upmarket environment, like this one, or for something in between, middle class development, as this one. In all these environments, you have the connected kitchen and living room, you have the connection to the outdoors, as in the balcony here, and you have a direct, um, an attempt to, to do flexible programming, meaning that you don't designate the living rooms and the sleeping rooms in such a harsh way, because these flats now are being inhabited by people who live in non-traditional family situation. It's no longer the nuclear family with the housewife and the breadwinning father. You have uh, patchwork families, you have single mothers, you have um, flatmate situations between students or also between older people. You have gay couples, you have whatever. They, like the, the traditional family is a tiny minority in most big Eastern European, in most big Western European cities. So obviously there is a development that this doesn't become a model anymore. So, so to conclude, if you look at this new tenement city, there are obviously, or you can say, the new tenement city um, combines a numerous advantages compared to the tower block developments of the 1960s and 1970s. There is an increased urban life exchange. There is no longer a, the, decay, the decay of the city center. There is cultural generations and the inner cities are rediscovered as places for children. But on the other hand, there is a clear motion towards visible inequality and towards also the acceptance of inequality. The tower block development, such as Suhif, 
were built with the idea in mind that there is a goal of achieving acceptable living conditions for the whole of society and that the state has the power to implement that. In the new tenement city, inequality is being accepted now. You can see different facades of richer, of poorer people. There is no longer a goal of providing equal living conditions. And this obviously leads to a polarization and a fragmentation of society. And one finds this curious uh, contradiction that at the time when social inequality is increasing, as in Germany, as in Britain, as in France, as in all of those countries, uh, the indicators of social inequality are much worse nowadays than they are than they were in 1980. That nowadays, in contrast, there is so much talk and so much rhetoric of the integrative uh, uh, 19th century cities where all these urban citizens are living in peaceful um, collaboration with each other. So. If you look at these advantages and disadvantages, they don't apply or they don't play out this in the same way in all these environments. There are clear local differences, and my research has shown that you find um, uh, uh, a rather different development, despite the fact that the architecture looks very similar. You find different environments in Vienna, in Copenhagen and in, in, in Glasgow and in Berlin and so on and so on. And uh, one of the biggest differences that I saw with regard to whether the goals of a mixed cities are being achieved had to do with whether these environments retained a strong influence by the state authorities. For example, the Austrian state has never renounced to its responsibility for housing their citizens. They still sponsor, finance housing, and they use housing as a means of promoting social policies with goals that I personally find very convincing, such as the goals of sustainability, of uh, not car dependency, of uh, um, um, uh, mixed use, etc., etc. So there one can say that the idea of the sentiments, new tenement city of being a mixed environment actually was um, rather successful, as opposed to uh, a city such as Glasgow, where the state has successively retreated from its responsibility with housing their citizens, where in every decade since the 1970s, the more power was given to the market and less regulation was applied. There, these disadvantages, such as the increasing inequality and social fragmentations, are much more visible than in Austria or than in Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Thank you to Florian Urban for this interesting lecture and next we will have a chance to ask questions or to raise your comments. Before that we have two technical reasons to have a break. Uh, who has the contact folder? Please uh, move it on. People could leave their contacts for our newsletters. and. Uh, in this last lecture, we will have to express our gratitude to the organizations who supported uh, this uh, program, Thank you by Night. Thank you to the uh, Center for Urban History and the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, Office in Ukraine, and uh, the Department for Development of Lviv City Council and the Information Partner, the uh, Municipal Company Lviv Electrotrans. And next, we expect to see your hands raised. We can see the first hand raised. Uh, the moderator is most convenient, is always in the back benches. Here I am. 
I wanted to ask you uh, if you if you could comment. I don't know if you saw uh, a couple of days ago. Richard Florida said he saw he was sorry. So <laughs> I wanted to to ask you if you if you could comment on this. And uh, regarding uh, these tendencies that you described uh, about the, this new romanticism uh, earlier uh, about the 19th century and so on and so forth, uh, could you? perhaps predict um, what is going to be a new tendency. Uh, now, as we see the new romanticism, for example, for socialism, uh, with this, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, with this uh, huge disappointment with uh, the transition and, and the wild capitalism happening. That's it. Well, thank you. Um, Richard Florida hasn't apologized to me yet. So, I actually don't know for what he apologized. Um, I think he's a very ambiguous personality or, and, and some of these ideas I conceive as quite ambivalent. We can never talk about it afterwards, it would really lead too far about that. So, um, so it's just a short comment. In terms of top tendencies in the future, um, I would say it basically depends on, 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 on rules and regulations, what is happening with there. If the, well, and also nostalgia for socialism, it depends what does it mean. I mean, is there a nostalgia for, for, uh, uh, for the strength of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union being feared by the rest of the world under Stalin? Well, that's probably a very dangerous development, I would say. If there is a nostalgia for, um, for uh, the fact that in the Soviet Union, as in most Eastern European countries, uh, there was a guaranteed right to dwelling, no matter how, uh, how badly it was carried out in practice, but that there was, in theory, at least no homelessness. I think this could be something that, is, that could be instrumental for calling for uh, uh, state action to uh, regulate uh, the housing environment and uh, I think in, there are examples in, in, in Western Europe where this has happened. I mean Denmark is one of these examples. There was a restructuring of the housing provision system. Uh, the welfare state is not the same, not at all the same as it was in the 1980s but the basic parameters that there is state responsibility and there is state regulation, they have remained. And uh, in may, most Eastern European countries, this was not the case. But even there you see differences. In the Czech Republic, for example, there is still a comparably high degree of, uh, 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 of state responsibility for housing and the housing situation is not at all that polarized between rich and poor as for example in Poland where uh, this the state has uh, much more to a much higher degree retreated from its responsibility. Thank you uh, for your wonderful lecture. I have a question regarding um, the tenements and the gentrification that you hinted at. Uh, so basically you mentioned that um, you know the working class is being pushed out of these new developments. Um, so where exactly are they being moved? Um, you know, since since the te the new tenements are clearly more targeted towards the middle class, um, and I'm wondering if this situation is similar in Western Europe and also you know the gentrification. Um, and sort of moving towards downtown in American cities, for instance. Um, and my second question is also regarding, you know, this this idea of the uh, tenement um, in the Eastern European context. So um, the tenements that were remade um, into the communal housing, you know, in the Soviet times, and are now. Um, returning to their more original conditions. So I'm wondering if you um, could comment on that, if you see this also as a similar kind of um, return 
to the historical tenement in Eastern Europe, in a sense, as well. Well, thank you very much for the question. It's very difficult to speak of gentrification. Gentrification usually has a negative connotation, but one should not forget that in the 1970s, when these refurbishment uh, uh, policies started, actually gentrification, or meaning the influx of wealthier people, was considered the salvation of the city center, because in the 1970s you had decaying city centers. And uh, this condition has not completely disappeared. You still have conditions, for example, in a post-industrial city such as Rotterdam, in which uh, there is state policy of drawing wealthier people to the city center, and that is also promoted by left-leaning parties. So, and there, the bogeyman is not the rich guy who drives the poor working class family out, the bogeyman is uh, uh, basically ghettoization, areas in which only poor people live and only marginalized people live. So again, it's always a question where. Uh, if you look at what is happening in the majority of wealthier West European cities, there is this tendency of richer, wealthier people moving into the city center. Um, in cities such as Berlin, uh, there is a tendency now that the former working class people are pushy, pushed out to the periphery. That could be different typologies. It could be the Rayone, the tower block developments. Um, in other areas such as Glasgow, for example, where the, uh, which is not such a booming, economically booming city, uh, you still have a rather mixed environment of the tenement city. So it's very hard to uh, make a generalization. But the tendency is clear. Richer people to the 19th century buildings, poorer people to either modernist tower blocks or other low-rise typology, uh, typologies in the, in the periphery. Thank you so much for, for your lecture. And it's a fairly simple question. Is it a story about a bigger city? Because this, your cases are really mostly capital cities. So um, does size matter? Um, also, if some of your cases are really global cities, so how this tenement story and is also a story about international market for real estate and where people you know, get apartments but come from different countries. So that's uh, one question. And another question is uh, mm, what happened, especially at the very beginning, when this movement of people towards the center happened, what happened to these peripheral areas, so decentralized, suburban, so where people moved right after the war, for example. So if there is a uh, any connection. And the third, if you talk about this like, diversity or new formats of diversity and interaction, in such developments, what are the sites for this? Are these like, kindergartens, schools, playgrounds? So where people of different backgrounds do interact? Uh, and if that was somehow design thoughts and then how it was realized? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, size matters in terms of, uh, in, well, from my research, size matters in terms of um, how extreme certain um, developments are, but in my uh, uh, research project I tried to look at uh, cities of different sizes and uh, my experience was that it applies in the same way to small, smaller towns, not as extreme. Obviously, in booming cities, you have more because these like wealthier people are moving to the booming cities. So in Berlin, you have like more um, uh, more extreme development, as for example in Rotterdam, which is much smaller. Um, 
Second question about the, what happened to the peripheral developments. Again, the story is different and it had very much to do with, uh, with municipal policy. So this is what I always want to find out. There is local policy matters. You can uh, support certain global developments or you can do something against it. And the Copenhagen case is quite interesting because um, if you compare it in um, like one reason why real estate in Berlin became so expensive in the, uh, uh, the, the in that in recent 10 years and why the, 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 the rents have risen so much has also to do with like an instant stable global situation that you had wealthy people from whatever Greece and what how many other countries as well who invested or didn't want to invest in their own country and then they bought real estate in the center of Berlin because they say oh it's the German capital it won't go down so, so obviously to allow for that you need certain legislations that makes that possible in Copenhagen for example you cannot buy a flat if you are not a resident in the country so uh, whatever Spanish, Greek, uh, uh, Russian, whatever person who wants to invest their money in outside their unstable countries cannot buy real estate in Copenhagen. Obviously there are ways around this, obviously the laws are not constantly you know, watertight, but it makes it much more difficult and it, let, it had, an, had a noticeable effect on how the market, real estate market uh, developed in Copenhagen as opposed to Berlin. Um, the third question uh, uh, about the the uh, the site of interaction. I didn't do sociological research, so I was mostly looking at uh, basically the architectural discourse and the, how these um, environments were described in the social press. So I can only say my suggest or my my my, my hunch or my. Um, what I, my assumptions are that the uh, uh, places where people interact in these inner city neighborhoods are pretty much the traditional ones. I mean, uh, it's schools, it's cafes, it's libraries, it's workplaces. But the important point is that this is a post-functionalist uh, 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 development, meaning a post-industrial uh, uh, neighborhood. It means that People are no longer in the city, first and foremost, because the city is a place of production, as it was in the 19th century, where you would go to the big city to find work in a factory or to build up a factory. People come to the city or people use the city as a place of control. And particularly the um, sort of, uh, well, I wouldn't want to call the creative classes because it's such a loaded word, but, uh, people who uh, work in uh, a certain, um, uh, for example, IT-based industries, they need the city precisely for these functions that cannot be replaced by the internet. If you work in IT, you still need to have certain meetings and you still need to have uh, uh, um, to, to, to connect to people through face-to-face -face contact. And those contacts context that cannot be replaced by the internet, for this you need the city. And this is why the city becomes more important in the uh, post-industrial period. Sorry, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> During the planning and the designing of some cult uh, buildings like uh, mosques or synagogues, uh, how should how far should they consider the environment peculiarities? Should these buildings uh, take into account the surrounding public environment, or how do we address this issue? And the next short question: How can modern art? For example, maybe you know the Banksy. How do they influence uh, on the price levels for the housing? Do they matter? Do we need them at all? And uh, do they have make any difference? And how important they are in the environment? They might have some impact on the uh, prices for the real estate, etc., and the housing. Do they? Should they? 
Well, thank you for the question. Uh, the first question I can only give like a personal opinion. Uh, I think any building has to take uh, into account the, 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 the immediate surroundings and obviously a religious building has to take into account how the, like basically the structure of the community. Your second question is, uh, um, well, my short answer would be no, it's not like one bank C that makes the real estate price increase, but uh, obviously the activity of artists in a particular neighborhood is connect connected to many other activities in uh, uh, creative uh, economic activities. And as a sum, the gallery, the Banksy, the museum, the, 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 the foundation of new um, uh, establishment of, 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 uh, of new businesses, etc., etc., has a huge influence. And if you think about the entire discourse, then yes, then the art does make a difference because it can tip the image of, an, um, of a neighborhood toward the better. But again, this is impossible to prove, so you can only talk really about correlations, and you cannot really see what was, whether, like, what was the influence of one particular piece of art. There was an implication that an area with high real estate prices is a successful neighborhood. That is, in my opinion, a very limited uh, definition of success because basically it is only a success for the people who own real estate and in any given neighborhood this is just a minority. Good evening, that was very enlightening, uh, enlightening lecture. I thank you very much for many insights. I have a small comment and a question. When you have been speaking about new tenement, actually you have been speaking about old tenement rebuilt or improved. The motto for the whole lecture could be take a, an old <laughs> story and make it better, take, take a sad song and make, make it better. So we uh, here have been exposed to the uh, unsuccessful experience of penetrating the future by the urban planners and architects of 1960s who actually failed and another experiment which was made in the last two and a half or three decades which actually in very many ways is a kind of nostalgic because it's trying to reproduce and improve something which already existed in that very city or in, in some other so-called European cities. So my question would be a little bit about imagination and uh, about um, ambition to imagine the future. Do you think that new tenement is actually a little bit pessimistic? Does it say us about the population of Europe and how could you think about what will happen to the new tenement in the next three decades, let's say. Do you think there are some signals it's already a little bit out of date? What was the blind spot of, of the project of rebuilding the cities according to the tenements of late 19th century in contemporary Europe? Thank you. Very, very interesting and very, very broad question. Um, my book, my research project was about newly built houses, but obviously they are closely related to the renaissance of the old tenements. So first people renovated 19th century buildings, then they built new buildings that were similar to that. Clear, clear case, just not part of my research. Um, the second part of your question uh, uh, I find particularly interesting because if we talk about Success and failure is difficult to... Well, you first have to clear about what the categories are. Um, with regard to the quote-unquote postmodern categories, like the post-functionalist categories, that a good city is a city of mixed 
social classes, mixed functions, a city where you have many people on the street, where you have active community life, where you have, for example, with these categories, Suhiv sounds, looks to me like an extremely successful city. It has everything that a Western European city planner wants. There are children playing on the street, there is a com comparably mixed social environment, you have public spaces that are being used by people, you have community organizations, etc., etc. So, yeah. The fate of the new tenements, or of the, no, let me rephrase it, the fate of the old tenements of the building that in the 1960s was torn down and not at all considered good, and from the 1970s onwards, all of a sudden was re-uncovered, discovered, this shows to me the flexibility of urban form and how also a modern tower block neighborhood could be reframed in a much more positive way. And I do not exclude at all that in 10 years a tower block could be the most, the coolest place to live for those people who have the choice. I think where we have to have a much harder time of, of, of or where, like, one of the developments that certainly will not be reversed in the near future is the, the, uh, the question of, of, of location, that the center is always better than the periphery. But then the question is always, like, also, how big is what we still consider the center? Is there a possibility to have central functions also in an area such as Suhif that makes them attractive? Because we have to remember that also the 19th century neighborhoods of Lviv in the 19th century were peripheral. They were not part of the city center, they were not considered part of the city center, they were considered part of like the outskirts. I want to thank you as well for the lecture and uh, one more question uh, regarding the future of the tenement and housing and uh, as you mentioned the nuclear family uh, and housing for nuclear family became like a tiny minority within the household structure of the contemporary um, housing and um, as we know for example to challenging the future one of the challenges is for example climate refugees and uh, in terms of you uh, told us regarding who built and where and the structure of the city how do you think who and where will be more sensitive to these challenges and in which way do you think it might be possible to solve it uh, with the housing thank you um. Again, I have to distinguish with what's my, what's my research, what have, what have I found out from my looking at these buildings, and what would be my personal recommendation for the future. Um, if you ask my personal recommendation or my personal ideas, um, I am in favor of densification. I think uh, uh, the cities should be dense, and, and, and we will need more people in the city center. So I am I think that the development of returning to the city center, stopping suburbanization, stopping the dissolution of the city is um, is a clear good one. Uh, I think in terms of or in light of limited resources uh, we should never uh, uh, repeat the uh, the mistakes of the 1960s uh, of tearing down uh, uh, valuable dwelling spaces. I think adaptive reuse is the way to go. You should not tear down tower blocks as they actually do in Glasgow. I don't think that they're doing that here, probably because they don't have the money, but in Glasgow all these tower blocks are being torn down and I think that was a mistake actually, but pure, um, purely in terms of, 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 of resources that are being destroyed basically. Um. Thank you, Tim, for the good uh, presentation. Connected with the previous question, you, you tell that uh, you think that densification of the cities is a good approach, uh, but uh, you showed the examples of uh, Vienne, and I want to ask you, what do you think about building 
new large neighborhoods, new building new large rayone. Uh, for example, in Vienz, uh, like Zeestadt, it's large scale, in large scale neighborhood, new one with wholly new buildings. What do you think about life, the potential of life in there? I think one thing that we that we should learn, or where say one has a, there is a positive aspect of the new tenement discourse of the kind of the negotiation of difference and the different actors and idealizations etc. Apart, but one positive thing is is to see that a city that is um, built and administered by different actors is always working better as one that is. Uh, uh, built and administered by a single big institution. So I think that is one thing that we can learn from the past. Um, and in that respect, uh, like a big centrally planned neighborhood is uh, likely to be much, uh, uh, much less flexible and therefore um, much harder to react to the changes in the future that are all likely to come. The example that you, you mentioned, the example in Vienna, you mean the 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 the, the Aspern Lake Town. I think it is a centrally planned neighborhood, but among all the centrally neighborhoods, it's probably one one of the better. And that has to do, first of all, with the with the amount of organization that was put into that. Uh, uh, that, for example, led to the fact that you have public transport there even before the flats first flats were finished, I mean, that's incredible, you know, I say, wow, <laughs> they were even able to do that. I think it has also to do with the fact of, uh, that Vienna as a whole is comparative, comparatively small, you know, this is only 10 kilo, or less than 10 kilometers from the city center, so it's not really in the outskirts, if you compare that with like Moscow, you can still, you're still in the city center in a comparatively uh, a small amount of time. And also that um, organized that, that that it was to a large extent organized and built by different actors because you had different developers, different uh, partially self-organized people who were building their buildings there. So, so, yeah. I have a short question. Thank you for your great lecture, and I have a short question still. Do you know the architecture of Lviv? Uh, how good do you know architecture of Lviv and Sikhiv in particular? And uh, what are your impressions of this architecture and Sikhiv in particular? It is a mix, in fact. We can see the building with a Ger uh, German uh, design project uh, and uh, Yugoslavian design project, as they say. And what is your attitude to globalization in architecture? For example, in the industrial neighborhoods, is it better to use the best practices and best examples of world architecture or should it be locally dependent architecture from local architects who know their local culture or maybe we should be talking about just good projects and designs uh, but brought from other countries? Difficult question. <laughs> um, I don't know Sihif that well. My impression of Suhiv is limited to the center, basically the area around here, and to a few walks that I did through the neighborhood. And therefore, I just compared it to the other tower block developments with which I'm familiar, the ones in East Germany, the ones in Glasgow, the ones in Poland, etc. So, um, yeah. Local versus international. I think it's a given that the models are international. There are no local architects anywhere in the world who have not seen what is being built in other countries. This is just because there is the internet and that cannot be, um, uh, uh, that cannot change anymore and it also shouldn't be. So I think one should rather look at what they are doing, not whether or not they are international versus local uh, and I think the, uh, the urban planning goals are probably for a neighborhood more important than the architecture, meaning how do the public spaces look, 
uh, what is the density, what is the connection to the city center, what is public transport, uh, how is the distribution of flats being organized, uh, who has access to flats, what is the price of flats, rental versus ownership, etc., etc. So these are the more important aspects. Yeah, uh, one more question. Uh, have you noticed that in Ukraine people really like to modify their own balconies, uh, the facades? <laughs> My question would be, how would you feel about the building modified by every resident in that building? Is it a good tendency? Uh, is it a way, either way to make it work for better? Again, I have a very limited uh, uh, knowledge of Suhiv. To me, this all made a very positive impression. I said, like, if I compare that to some of the the very clean neighborhoods in, like, East East Berlin, for example, I said, Suhiv looks much nicer precisely because you have this, you know, approach, we make this neighborhood our own. It, it sort of irradiates that people take responsibility, that they you know, want to make their, their environment a better place to live. This is why they built their little balcony or they built a veranda in the balcony and they are not just thinking about, about like moving away in the next possible way. So to me this is a rather positive, uh, 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 gives me a very positive impression. I, I have a question about the uh, like such movement as downsizing. Like very often, like the people prefer to live in a really tiny apartment, but in the city center. And my question is, how the developers react on this? Do they uh, plan the really tiny apartment in the new one buildings, or is like more prefer to the some like reusing some spaces? Well, again, it depends on what society you're talking about um, and basically about the percentage of the society that actually has a choice to where they want to live. Uh, in poorer countries, uh, I mean, if you compare whatever Germany to Ukraine, obviously in the Ukraine, the, 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 the amount of people who can choose where they can actually live is much smaller than in West Germany. So, um, uh, developers' reaction to that um, plays a role or the fact that this has an influence is, is mostly related to how many people actually have this choice. Um, they generally do, I mean, developers want to sell, but they also uh, do it within the limit that is set to them by the municipality. And this was one of the points I was making when, it, when, when, when I talked about like the, the new tenement with a like, legible public space as opposed to the um, to the gated community where you say well, if you don't have legislation that prohibits uh, gated communities uh, uh, developers will always build inward looking typologies they will always build something that is not connected uh, to uh, the public space and better to control because that is easier to sell thank you again, thank you again.